Hello, welcome to Love Rugby League HQ again. We're Love Rugby League Weekly, a little bit later than build for a whole host of reasons, but we're really glad to be with you. It's the first of our World Cup specials. Yep. Afternoon, Dave. Afternoon, James. So, uh, we've both watched the game this morning. Uh, 18-4 to Australia. The, them pesky Aussies got us at the back end of the game again. Yeah, it was um, It was a good game, I thought. It was quite a quite a good game. Um, you, England started well, didn't they? But I think Australia gradually got in, got more and more into the game and, uh, and just sort of wound, um, ground England down. I thought the score flattered Australia a little bit at the end. Obviously, they had that intercept try sort of at the end. Um, but it is what it is. I mean, you probably ex- the sort of score you'd expect maybe from that sort of game. And um, I have to admit, I was a little bit worried after about twenty minutes because everything in the first twenty minutes sort of went England's way, didn't it? We scored with the first proper proper yeah. use. Then the Aussies started piling on the pressure. Defence was holding though, despite conceding all those dropouts. And then it was almost as if everybody reached twenty minutes, and it kind of like. They hit a brick wall, didn't they? I don't know about the wall of white. It was the brick wall, wasn't it, for England? Yeah, I think um, I think they defended quite well. The line defence was was pretty good, and um, they were tackling well. And then obviously Australia got the two, you know, maybe the two tries, and um, you know, off a couple of bad plays. It's got to be said, you know, one of the I think was the, one of the tries came off the back of a bit of a loose pass from Widdop, and um, and then obviously there was that penalty call. Um, Did you? Th- there weren't a lot of penalties within this game, were there? Which uh, I actually enjoyed the fact that they were letting it flow, even though it had me shouting at the television. I don't know about you at all, but it had me at the television standing up and shouting, "That's a high tackle around his head." Yeah, I mean, if you watch the NRL, there's a lot of um, you don't see loads of penalties. You see a lot of completed sets. You know, um, you see a lot of six tackle kicks, and um, you know, from quite deep. Whereas in Super League, I don't think you see that very often. You don't. You don't often see a, a period of a game go where there's a team stuck in their own half, they kick long, then the other team goes stuck in their own half and they kick long. Whereas in the NRL, you see that quite a bit. Um, and then, obviously, there wasn't, like I say, there wasn't loads of penalties, but then there's two penalties in the game that both went against England that ultimately were, were pivotal to the game. The first one leading to that second try, was it? And then, obviously, the one towards the end, which effectively ended the game as a contest. Yeah, it was it, for twelve four. It was basically o- o Lachlan giving away a penalty line in the rut one and getting caught on the wrong side. Yeah, and then uh, was Elliot Whitehead trying to pull the ball out? Yeah, and obviously, well, I mean, for one, he retained possession of the ball for the second one, and then for the first one, there was a very similar one with uh, Jermaine McGilvery when um, when Lomax sort of sold him down the river with a bad pass, didn't he? And, and McGilvery got up and tried to play the ball and the, the defender was still on the floor. and, and He, he played up. it into him, didn't he? Which yeah, in Super League, I, they'd give a penalty for that, I wouldn't they? I think the referee's argument was that it was a dominant tackle and it was like, well, you know, how could it have been a hmm. dominant tackle? Yeah, it was a good hit, but he was well behind the rook and it was just like, you know, I mean, he was having a bit of debate about, you know, the rubber, an Australian referee giving the rubber the green to, to Australia and I'm sure, I know Ian Smith was, the, the former Super League referee, was chirping in with it. Um you know, it wasn't a case of us questioning the integrity of the referee, but it just having an Australian referee referee Australian matches opens you up to that debate mm. as to whether they're being fair or not. It's like that whole can you referee your hometown club thing that's going yeah, on in, in Super the, League the, the and over here, isn't you know, it? And it? The whole thing it came back to Steve Ganson, I think it was who, who first raised it, wasn't it? Because it was like he couldn't get Challenge Cup finals and Super League Grand Finals because St Helens were already in them, were mm. always in them, and it was like, well, okay. But so what? If the best players, if the best player is Scottish, he's never going to play in a World Cup final. Hmm. You know, it's just tough. You've got, well, you could, you could turn it around into football, can't you? And Georgie Best. Yeah, yeah, and it's just like you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's tough. Um, I don't, I don't care if the best referee in the world can't referee the, the World Cup final because he's Australian. Get the second best in the world or the third best. Just get someone who, you know, you can't. There's no, there, there can be no questions over. Hmm. Over the integrity, and you know, I'm not saying that there is any questions over is it Matt Chetchin's integrity or anything like that, but it just opens you up to the questions that you just don't need to be. It's something else to debate that you don't need yeah, to debate. Like, uh, could you imagine the football World Cup final being England against Spain and them having an English referee? No, I can't imagine that. England's well, never going to win another football World Cup, are they? There's too well, many foreigners over here, just like foreign halfbacks, which is my big bugbear, as you know, through this show. Where you've got hashtag player pool, I've got hashtag okay, foreign right, halfbacks. Right, okay. uh, <laughs> Michael's, like I said, poor kicks and mistakes. Uh, the kicking game was pretty poor, wasn't it? There was a lot of. 
There wasn't much. There wasn't many. There wasn't questions. a lot of variation, was there? A lot of, it was a lot of just kicking for the sake of it. Um, and I know a few people. I know a few people were saying what England needed to do was was get the ball dead, hmm. um, even to sacrifice for a twenty meter tap. Um, but you see, I wouldn't do that because you, you, that 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 initial tackle, and especially at the time when the the Aussies were dominant, they were really striding forward, weren't they? Yeah, the back end of the first half. I just think you know, kicking it to them on the full is sort of like playing in their hands a little bit, um, and then you know, mistakes. Like I said, there was a mistake by Woodup, I think, for the, well, for two of the tries. I mean, you can let him off for the third one because they were chasing the game. Um, but then there was just mistakes, you know, sloppy errors. You know, I think James Graham threw a threw a loose pass out in midfield at, at one point that was intercepted, and it's just little mistakes that maybe don't add up to anything at the time, mm. but ultimately help swing the momentum or prevent you from getting a foothold in, in the game. I actually thought we were a lot better in that second half. Uh, Gareth Widdett really stepped up. I thought, you know, for, for a player that I'll, you know, rightly hold my hands up here and say, I don't rate, I don't think he's ever had a good performance for England. I thought he came up with a good performance he, for England. He, who's that, Widdett? Widdett, yeah. See, I, I was sort of a bit like, I mean, he played okay. Uh, I don't think he had a bad game. Um but, you know, everyone's raving about him being, you know, the best stand-up in the NRL, and it's like we never really get to see that from England. And I, you know, part of that is that because of the players around him. Potentially, I mean, obviously Luke Gale wasn't wasn't particularly great either. Um, I mean, I, you know, I'm a big fan of, of George Williams, but I, I I do understand people saying we need to stick with the same R pack pair, and you know, instead of chopping and changing it every every game, which we seem to have a habit of doing in these sort of short series. Just stick with them and, and see where they get to. I mean, the other thing is that we've took two specialist centres to Australia and only one of them played. We ended up with Bateman doing a job, an adequate job, it must be said, out in the centres. But there were just that time when you think, well, a Percival could come up with a pass or he could slip something out and yeah. he's got a bit more vision, whereas yeah. Bateman I think that's the th dropped on it a couple of times, didn't he, where the ball sort of got to him. There was one play I thought of where there was a last tackle... We got a last tackle quite close to the line and Bateman went blindside. Mm. And it was just like, you know, would an experienced centre have done that? Um, and yeah, I, don't, I think I think in terms of the general gameplay, you know, tackling and, and running and, and passing and whatever, you know, Bateman's fine in the centre, but you want your special... Like I say, when you've got to come up with these special plays or, the, you know, out the back door pass or whatever... You want someone who's used to doing it and, and knows the right place and the right time to do it. And, you, and you know, we've seen Percival do that for St. Helens because that's what his job is. Um, I'm talking about guys that are used to doing it. We, we saw another superb performance from Billy Slater. Yes, there was a couple of handling errors in there, but I think his, his general kit returns, the way that he linked play together, crosses for a crucial try as well. Well, I thought it was interesting that he, he was... He praised the England back three after the game, so Lomax, McGilvery and, and Ryan Hall. To be fair, I mean, Ryan Hall had a good game. McGilvery looked like he was on fire at part of it, didn't he? Yeah, and you know, and, and Lomax copped a bit of flack for a mistake or two, but I don't think he made any more mistakes than Slater did. No. Um, you know, so, you know, you look at, there was two instances towards the end of the first half where McGilvery and Hall both kept England in the game, and they're both players who seem to step up for the internationals, you know, they mm. seem to relish the internationals and, you know, they do well at club level, don't get me wrong, but they seem to, I think there's there's players like that who are good club players, but then they can go up a notch for internationals mm. and I think, you know, McGilvery and, uh, and Ryan Hall are two of them sort of players, you know, is Luke Gale that sort of player, you know, the jury's still out on, on that. Well, I mean, I, I, I watched this alongside my dad this morning, you know, like, and he's there, he's saying, I don't rate that Luke Gale at all. I think he's just been playing behind a decent pack at Cass I mean, all season. That, well, that's I, half your battle, isn't I it? Think, I think that's a bit unfair to say that, you know, he, he's only he's only being shown to be good at Casper because of a good pack. Because, you know, I think the stuff that they've done um, at Casford, you know, they deserve credit for. But ultimately, if you look at Gale, where he's, you know, his pathway up, he, you know, he was at Leeds... He dropped down to Doncaster. He's ended up at Harlequins. He's been at Bradford. He's sort of. It's taken him a long while to get to this point, mm. and, you, and you sort of feel if there wasn't flaws to his game, you know, he would have got to where he is now a lot sooner. Mm. Um, you know, it's not like he's not George Williams. He's not 21, 22 years old, or, or whatever. You know, he's at the other end of his career, and it's only really now that he's getting the opportunity in these big games, and it's he's got to turn it around. Pretty, you know, we're expecting. You know, we're expecting him to deliver now because mm. that's the age he is. 
Whereas actually his experience in terms of these big games, he's he's got less experience than a George Williams mm. at the big games. So in that um, case then, why is a George Williams not in the... Well, it's the, it's the old six and seven question. You know, obviously some, some coaches don't say that there's any difference between them. Um, you know, I've read a few comments where people saying Widdop and Gale are too similar. Mm-hmm. Um, but then could you play Williams and Widdop because you both technically stand offs? But I mean, like, you know, how, how important is this? You know, what's the difference between you've a just got, and a scrum half? You've just got split fields now, haven't you, yeah, as half backs? So, they know, run like one down one side, one down the other, really. Well, I think now, he, I think because he's made his bed with the Widdop and Gale situation, I think he's either got to stick with them mm-hmm. or change it for the next match, but keep it. So if he's going to change it, change it for match two, but then stick with it after that. But, uh, you know, I think to, to change it every game like we seem to have had the habit of recently, um, you know, I think need to avoid that. Um, you know, as much as people might say, well, after the Australia game, we've now got two games you'd expect them to to win. You've still got to do the do You've the business, haven't you? Job. Yeah. Um, also as well, I was a little bit disappointed we didn't get to see Alex Wormsley today because I was really looking forward to to sort of seeing him lay it down to those Aussies because yeah, when you look at the likes of David yeah. Clemmer he'd match him in, yeah. in size wouldn't he had he? a virus I think they were saying mm. um, and obviously lost Sam, Sam Burgess so I think the reports were that he might be out for three or four weeks medial mm. lig- ligament injury so that's that's a dreadful bit of luck because he was having a good game as well wasn't he Sam I know Ian Millward was raving about him on the on yeah, the commentary two, two big players really that you, you want to perform you know if you're going to do well you want them to, to you know them to you know Warms and Burgess could potentially be big players, um, you know, like James Graham is. Um, Neil's asking if it's cold. The, can you hear the radiators? Uh, no, the radiators coming on now. No, I know it's got. No, I know, but the radiators coming on now. So it's branded, it's branded as well. Yeah. It's branded. Notice I've no brands yet. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I mean that that that's it, isn't it? Really, I think. Um, <laughs> well, we, We've got some more, yeah, we've got some more oh there we go yeah, so here we go there is there is some branding I'll have to give it a whirl won't I just excuse me just just carry on Jim yeah yeah well. um, we've had a comment through let me just see this has come through from Martin um, I think we discussed this the three penalties two at crucial stages there you go there's branding now I don't know if you looked after with that on than you did before well it's it's useful it's going to be useful for when we do our outside broadcast yeah you're right you're right, you're right. so yeah um, I'll yeah. take that off now. I see, but well, I don't mind making a fool of myself. Yeah, well, someone's got to have it. Uh, <laughs> yes, Martin saying about the three penalties, two against the, at crucial stages. Um, you know, and like we've discussed about that already, haven't we? About there wasn't many penalties, but the two at crucial times. Um, you know, and then are there maybe penalties that certain players would get away with in Super League? Uh, yeah, yeah, because he, he does often get away with that yeah, type of stuff, so, doesn't he? Uh, yeah. Or Lachlan in particular, with yeah, that, so, that sort of leaving leaving part of his body in the rook and getting on the wrong yeah. side of it. But I mean, it was one of them. I was thinking, well, are you, I suppose it's it's quite tongue in cheek. But are you going to beat? Um, are you going to beat Australia twice? You've only got to beat him once, really, haven't you? Yeah, so that's it. If you're going to beat him once, do you want to beat him in the first game or do you want to beat him in the in the final? Well, the key's now getting to that final, isn't it? You know, I mean, I noticed that uh, we had a, a comment off Declan as well. He already thinks it's nailed on for a, an Australia-New Zealand final. Well, people, We've not even seen New Zealand yet, though, because, I mean, yeah, they're a much weakened I mean, side, aren't they, than what's been in the past. To be honest, it'd be nice to see someone shake it up, and I know everyone's been talking about Tonga and, and, and you know, on paper looking a lot stronger. And it Never mind that to... island. Well, it, well, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to see somebody mix it up a little bit and um, and make a change. And, <laughs> Neil's yeah. responded, "Belly off crossroads." Yeah, that's what's just what. That's the look that I was He's looking for. Face for radio, <laughs> <haven't> <laughs> we'll use that as a way of plugging his commentary tomorrow at the, uh, yeah. the National Conference League Finals over at Widnes. So uh, make sure you tune into that. Yeah, we'll be hoping to uh, do it on the audio version of Facebook. Actually, so I've got all the equipment, uh, all the gear. No idea, as James often says regarding myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, obviously it was good. Um, what? Where did you watch it, Dave? Did you watch it on BBC? Uh, well, or Premier. I was fortunate in the fact that I watched the first half via BBC and the second half via Premier. Right. But I like the Premier coverage. Obviously, that was taking the was it Channel Seven Australia, yeah, yeah. Uh, because 
<coughs> they added a couple of little stats in there, you know, yeah. which I, I, you know me, I love yeah. my stats. So at one point we got to hear that when James Graham finally got replaced for the first time, he carried the ball in 11 times, he made 30 tackles, he made 99 metres. So I was thinking, oh, that's a pretty good performance from looking at the stats and the work that I've done over the course of the year. And then it was saying as well, because I was thinking, oh, Elliot Whitehead looks absolutely shattered. He looks like he's got nothing left to give. And then it, they popped up in commentary that he'd done 45 tackles. So that's the reason why. Yeah. So it was, it was good. But one thing I did notice with the BBC commentary is that the sound was ahead of the, yeah, yeah, I think I ahead of the video. Yeah, I think Actually, McGilvery had scored a try. And I'd, I'd noticed it from a few tackles. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, he's on the ball here with these, these hit-ups. And then, yeah, it become obvious it was about two or three seconds behind. But have you ever tried matching up actual live commentaries? No, you do, I thought you'd be able to manage it by now. But you do get that, though. You, you either get where you, you, you're five seconds behind or you're two seconds in front. There's no in-between. I have, I have tried it. I've, and nothing that I have ever done. You know, Obviously, these BBC boffins can't seem to manage it either, so I mustn't be, I mustn't be doing that bad a job myself. Yeah, so obviously a bit of an earlier start for tomorrow and Sunday's games. Um, to watch some of the other teams in action. Yeah, well, I'll only be able to see one of the games tomorrow, but I'm hoping for an early start on uh, on Sunday with regards to uh, having a, a watch of the Tongans. So I'm really interested to see how they go. I, I think one thing that interested me, actually, was the world rankings popped up on the BBC coverage, and obviously Scotland are fourth in the world, in the world rankings, and I just thought... How? It was ridiculous. How? Is well, that because they 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 were the well, fourth got, nation in the, the last into the four nations didn't in the they? last four nations successful in the Europe? Well, they drew with New Zealand, so I would presume that the way the ranking points work, that they get a lot of points for that. Was this the same rankings that also had Jamaica in thirteenth place? I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. I just remember seeing Scotland and thinking, I felt a bit sorry. I mean, we've had this conversation before. I feel a bit sorry for Wales because they're in tenth, mm. and it's like they've got pro clubs. They've got. Well, they've got semi-pro clubs, they've got plenty of players coming through, wherever you look at Scotland and it's a bit like, well, what Scotland got? One thing I'm pleased with, you know, from this whole structure for the World Cup and how, how it's all sorted out with the fixtures and whatnot, is the fact that we don't have those awful uh, matches for 7th and ninth place anymore, because we had right. those last time it was in Australia, and you knew that nobody wanted to be there, I think it yeah. was uh, I, I some more have, against I France were one of them. Sure, I'm not too sure about the format, it, I mean for me, I'd just chucked another two teams in and just made it four groups of four, but the problem is, is they've got to try and swindle the format as best as they can to ensure that the big three get in the semi-finals. Because that's who sells the tickets, yeah. isn't it? That's where and the that, draw cra- card is, isn't that, it? I was just like, the BBC were explaining the format, and obviously I knew what the format was, and I'm just like, how difficult does it have to be? So it's basically three from the first two pools, isn't it? Which yeah, are the then, four pools, and then so the, and then top one, the top one from each of the others. the others. But then obviously the others have the crossover games and all yeah. that malarkey. Well, we had crossovers yeah. last we time, last didn't time, we? Yeah, this is how we got... Like, for me, just have another two teams in it, and... And just stop mucking around. Just as long as, if you've seen my articles over the course of the week of my World Cup memories, just as long as we don't invite the New Zealand Maoris again, that made it a laughing start yeah. because you got New Zealand and anybody who couldn't get in that team was suddenly a Maori, weren't they? But then that's just like all, most of the other nations, though, isn't it, Dave? I suppose you could say that Australia have entered like 14, t- or, you know, yeah, that, 10 different that, teams in this. Yeah, Scotland, how many of them are Scottish? Yeah, well, one is. I know, David Scott. Well, well, is that just from Batley? We always do a weekly mention of Batley, so that's today's weekly well, mention you know of Batley. How many of them are Scottish, and how many of the Irish boys are Irish? Do you know what I mean? It's just like you mean you've not you've not found out about you know Michael McAlorum's Irish heritage. No, well, I'm not. Obviously, they've all got the heritage, but I mean, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's just right. like I'm only jesting. I'm only just. I know what you mean. But I yeah, know what anyway, you mean. Anyway, let's, uh, let's let's what what else have we got to debate? Well, I thought that we'd look again at a couple of these signings. There's been a couple of big moves this week, uh, namely. Mainly at Lee. Well, that's, that goes without saying. It looks like Lee are building a, a 30-man squad at the moment, doesn't it? Yeah, the Ridyard thing was interesting. It was a bit of a... Hang bizarre. on, that's out of Lee, that, though. I know, but we'll, we'll mention about that. Um, so if you didn't see it yesterday, Martin Ridyard signed for Featherstone. Featherstone announced it in the typically professional man- manner that Featherstone do, with a nice picture of him holding a scarf with John Duffy. Um, you know, everything's fine. You know, you sort of thought you expected it because he got farmed out of Lee last year on loan to Huddersfield, which was one of the most bizarre deals of last season. And then up pops a statement from Derek Beaumont basically kicking off that Ridyard hadn't told them or something or other, basically saying that it was courtesy for them to announce it at the same time and they were being courteous to him by not announcing this other half-back. And I'm just thinking, well, hang on. 
last season you struggled. You found out this local lad who's been a pivotal player for five years. Oh, he's, he's been brilliant since he's come through the door, basically. Well, exactly. So it's it's from like, 2009, he's been that, he's been well, in that first team. So you're looking the best part of ten years, and all of a sudden, whatever I don't know what happened, but Lee have hardly been blessed with our backs last season, and at, at one point. They've decided to farm Ridyard out. He's gone to Huddersfield. They were actually lower than Lee, I think, at the time he went. And you're like, and I, you know, from an outside, I think, well, why would you do that? Because they're strengthening a team that ultimately then hmm? got into the top eight. Well, arguably, he saved their season, didn't he? Because they were going nowhere. I mean, yeah. you know, we've, we've both spoken at various points over the year, the fact that he looked like dead man walking, yeah, didn't Rick he, Stone, the, Rick yeah. Stone? And you're just like, and I'm thinking, well, why would you do that? So then, So then now... You've got to the point where he's obviously returned, you know, obviously we've talked about next season. Lee have obviously made him some sort of offer. But then if he's gone and taken another offer, then then that's, that's surely up to him. I, I was a bit disappointed. I think I, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I can understand why Derek Beaumont might be miffed that he wanted to announce it at the same time, whatever, because he's a long-serving player or whatever. But the way I think Ridyard's being treated... Or the way it's not as if he's played every game for Lee last season. No, he only played five five you know games. I mean? It's not like he's played every game and then it's been public that they've offered him a deal. It was just I, I just think for me that was the thing where okay, Derek, be privately a bit pissed off about it, but don't be issuing a statement like that. I mean, got to put an eighteen certificate on that now because of your you've sorry, let your language sorry. slip I'm there. Sorry, but, 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 <laughs> but you see what I mean. I just think it's just one of them. I, I can understand. I can understand why he's annoyed, but. No, you don't need to be doing a statement like that. And then sort of like childishly saying, oh, well, we're now going to announce your half-back replacement at six o'clock, which suggests to me that they'd already decided they were replacing Ridyard anyway. Which kind of then cheapens that next announcement in a way, doesn't it? Well, because yeah. I, I, <laughs> and that's it. All you had to do, all he could have done, is not said anything about Ridyard, and then at six o'clock announce the new fella and just put, you know, the club would like to thank Martin Ridyard for his contribution. Do you think that Lee have maybe made a rod for their own bat now? Because I'd be expecting a press release every time thanking whichever players go in for the service, just, and, and they haven't had a they, have, they, they haven't done that in the past. I just you think know, sometimes but, you're just getting a bit carried away. Hmm. I think there's a few people. I think there's a few people who are a bit carried away and will believe with statements. Although to like be that. to be fair, I mean you're talking Featherstone Rovers, and you know Mark Campbell's had his first year of no, sayings as well, no, hasn't he? You know, yeah, so, but, but this think, is why this is why we love rugby league, isn't it? Because you get guys like that yeah, who are so but, passionate. But, I mean, and, I think at the same time, and don't get me wrong, you know, you know what Derek does and what he says is great most of the time. And you know, Mark says, but I think there's just certain situations where it's just not needed, and I think this was one of them times. I mean, certainly, you know, just to put my point of view across, I've seen Martin progress from a little little lad. 18 year old playing for Lee Academy going out to Warrington playing uh, reserve team rugby league going to Lee Miners and being absolutely pivotal in everything that they did at the uh, early to mid point of the uh, uh, the first decade of, of this century then he signs for Lee he's been absolutely pinpoint the guy that everybody's done everything to he's guided Lee into Super League he was the guy that I was expecting to kick on, and for some reason well, that never happened. Chance, though, did he? Did he only got the five games. He yeah, he, he only. Did. They actually were all right at the start of the season as well. Um, and I think you know he deserved to make his own decision. I think he'd earned the right to yeah. make his own decision. Uh, but what I'm saying is that a guy that's played what 220 games, I think, for Lee, uh, scored 1700 points. You know, you're not just talking about your average run of the mill player. Here. You're talking of a guy that's been yeah. loyal. You're talking of a guy that's you know given the best years of his career to Lee, and I well, think I that think he deserves a lot of credit he's for been that. Soured now though, I think by Lee by Lee's actions. Okay, yeah, he's gone and signed for someone else, but I think Lee Lee have let themselves down a little bit with the way that obviously this statement they just didn't need to do that. Mm. Um, mm. You know, be privately be a bit annoyed about it and. You'll learn from it, but you know, you don't need to do that. Um, okay. But then at the same time, it's good that Lee actually announced players properly, unlike Salford did in the Coo Cash area, where Coo Cash had just tweet that they'd signed and Tom Dick or Harry. At least Lee do it properly. What? They've um, signed a player called Tom Dick and Harry, have they? Yeah, apparently, Salford have brought Luke Burgess in, I believe that's the latest ah, right, okay. signing. I mean, um, he, he played for them uh, a couple of seasons ago, yeah, didn't he, he when he came back? and. Game, hmm. um, so yeah, that's a Salford signing, and, and Stuart obviously mentions Ben Murdoch Masilla. Obviously, his deal to Warrington's been confirmed. I think that they've overspent though, Warrington, on a player of. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong, good player, did really well last season, got himself in the dream team, but then where was he for the last 
two months of the season. He was rubbish. He looked like he put on a bit, of, he like he put on a bit of weight towards the back end of the season. I mm. thought. You know, like he was carrying a bit too much weight. Was that a case of was he injured? Did he come yeah, back too soon or something? You know, maybe. He so he was so important. Um, he was so important. So maybe that was why. Um, but an interesting signing. Warrington have obviously identified the need to get a bit more grit and aggression in the back row because you know they've had. You know, Ben, Ben. You know, with all due respect to Ben Curry and Jack Hughes and and them sort of players. Well, I don't know. Jack Hughes is a can be aggressive. I know, but he's not that. You know, he's not. He's not a player that. We're talking of a team. We're, we're talking of a team that's had Benny Westwood playing for him for the well, best no, part yeah, of ten no, years no, as well. well. Obviously, Westwood is very much a bit part player now, isn't he? And they sort of need someone to take that mantle off <coughs> him for being the angry aggressor type. You know, wide running back rower. Um, and you think they've got the man? Yeah, I mean, you see, I sort of wonder whether last season was just a flash in the pan well, I mean, for Ben I mean, Murdoch Masilla. I mean, we've had this conversation before where Salford had a really good start to last season. Mm. Everyone got all carried away. And I just think Salford did just out, they just overperformed in the first part of the season and then just resorted to mean halfway, you know, resorted to the, a bit like we always talk about Witness the previous season. Witness did exactly the same where they basically overperformed for the first half of the season and then just reverted to tight for the rest of the season yeah they started off like Leicester City finished off like Crystal Palace yeah yeah well yeah and that's it and, <laughs> and I think the problem is is everyone got everyone gets a bit carried away making players seem better than that better than they are and you know I'm not doubting that Murdoch Masilla is a, a, a you know a good player but he's got to do it every week at Warrington he can't just the thing is is the expectations are different Mm. At Salford, you know, at Warrington compared to Salford, and uh, well, you, you know, need to you need to turn on a, a seven or eight out of ten performance every week, yeah, don't yeah, you? Whereas you, can't, you can get away with a five or six at Salford, maybe with no disrespect to Salford. Yeah, yeah and that's it. Um, you know, and, and obviously the thing is, is at Salford, if you if you put a good game in the bank, or if you put a good few games in the bank, people remember. Mm. You know, your good few games in the bank. Whereas at Warrington, it's almost like, well, okay, so what? You had a good game last week. You know, this, yeah. this week's a new game. Uh, what do you reckon? Obviously, we're talking about Ben Murder at Masilla. I'd love your, your comments coming through. Um, so do remember you can share, like, get this uh, broadcast as far as you can get it. Um, another one, interestingly enough, was the uh, Jake Connor getting his extended deal at, at Hull. I think he's really earned it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, he's I think he's had, a, he's had a great first I season. The, the good thing about Jake Connor was that, obviously, when Sneed got injured... Um, and when Albert Kelly obviously was missing, they could switch him into the halves, and he and he actually, you know, he's actually useful there. And I think that gives you a good option because if you're carrying him at centre in the game, and one of your halves gets injured, you know that you can trust him to drop in the halves and then put one of your back rows out in the centres. And a lot of teams struggle with that sometimes mm. if they've not got, you know, if they've not got. Look at like look at Saint Helens for instance. Saint Helens got Percival and um, Morgan. Okay, yeah, yeah. In, in the centres. In the centres, yeah. If, if one of their halves gets injured, neither of them two centres can come in. Okay, yeah, they'll put John Wilkin in there or whatever, but just using their centres as an example, whereas that's like a whole, they've got someone in Connor who could actually help helps them out in a bit of a crisis, I think. Uh, you know, and obviously as a starting player, he's, he's, he's good. Hull are sort of just keeping quiet, aren't they, really? They've made two little, they've made two signings to replace Fenua and, and Gareth Ellis, and, um, you know, and they're going to try and build on their double challenge cut win. And I think it's I think it's interesting because you usually find that the best teams are the ones that don't do wholesale changes. Yeah, and that's it. I think you know the 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 the, ma- the most successful teams, like you say, the ones who who, who keep a core together, bring through their own players, um, which Hull you know Hull haven't necessarily done enough of. Mm. But the, I think they're starting to get there now, aren't they? Which uh, is interesting to see that both a little bit further down the rugby league food chain, both Workington and Whitehaven are doing just that. Where they're signing a lot of the the, the players that have served them well, or yeah, uh, I mean, you usually get that they swap players yeah, between you, themselves as well, don't you? You know, you look at the three, the three. You know, forget Bradford, but Leeds, Saints, Wigan. You know, what, how have they won all their Super League titles? They've won it with a with a core team of players who they've had for a long time, with a core team of players who've come up through their systems. You know, even the players that they bring in from elsewhere stay for a long time. They don't mm-hmm. have... And then when they do have players that are only there for a couple of years, 
the like superstar players or, or players that are going to make it. You know, like Jamie Lyon or, or someone like that. You know, if 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 there's someone who's not good enough, they'll they'll try and get rid of them as soon as they can. So we're thinking Hull by all all means the building in that same sort of respect, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, I think so. And it's taken Hull a while to get. Cause don't mm. Hull should be you know Hull should be for me a top four team. They've got the infrastructure, they've got the fan base, and it's taken them a while to get to this point. Um, and so now they've they finally got sort of the house in order, if you like, and they've got obviously got to build on that now. Talking about getting houses in order. What do you make? They finally announced, and it was tipped on this show last week by your good self, that yeah. it was all going to revert at uh, League One level to a 26-game oh, yeah. home and away competition. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's wow. as simple as you well, can well, understand. We lost two teams in that process. Oxford and Gloucester have, have bombed out. What do you make uh, of that? I think it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you, you're looking at the distance between both of those clubs yeah, and honest, Bristol. It doesn't really make sense, it's, it's does it? Yeah, it's been that. It's just been been Oxford have have not done anything really they come in they didn't get the fans there was no real connection with the Oxford Cavaliers club which has been there for years been around for years and they're still continuing uh, out of the Cavaliers yeah, yeah, so. I think, so I think this has just been a little bit of PR but my understanding is that when you know obviously four years ago there was a World Cup game in Bristol I was there and you know it seemed to be the, the logical step would have been to put a Bristol team in straight after that hmm. and my understanding is that was what originally was going to happen and then the decision was made to to take it to Gloucester instead of having it in Cheltenham. Ah right, okay. Um, you know, and because I mean, rumour has it that this Bristol uh, team is going to be based out of a university or a college setting, similar to, to what Gl- Gloucester, Gloucester yeah. was. Well, I, I, I'm I'm not too sure. I mean, there's a few. Uh, it's a bit cloak and dagger at the moment who's involved, but um, there's murmurings that maybe Bristol Sport are involved, and they oh, right, okay. so they own Bristol City Football Club, they own Bristol Rugby Union, they own Bristol Flyers basketball team. Um, and what they do is obviously they, they pool all the resources right, okay. and manage it. So, you know, all the media guys, the video guys work across all three or four sports, which means that they typically have got a more in-depth off-field staff than, you know, because each of these, as individuals, them clubs perhaps wouldn't be able to sustain a full-time media person, a full-time videographer, you know, whereas across the four different brands, they can do it. Um, so that would be a really interesting concept because it'd be nice to see a new team come into League One and do what, try and do what Toronto have done, hmm. but over here, you know, and try and be a bit bold and a bit brash and, you know, and say... I'll tell you what I quite like the fact of, the fact that they're not rushing in, into it either. They're giving them a year's grace to get all set up, get everything I mean, sorted. I like that because that shows prior planning. Well, it's just a case of whether it does happen. Um, you know, I'm trying to look at it from a positive no, no, though. No, I know, yeah, I know I that. that. I, mean, I know it's easy for me to I mean, sort of like just I mean, look at rugby league development on a on a map with a, a, a you know a set of darts and just say we'll have I'm, a team there, I'm we'll have a team there. That's happened before, hasn't it? I'm obviously Mr. Gifted, but you know, you look at four or five years ago, we had four new teams come in. Mm-hmm. Um, only th- oh no, five, it was meant to be. Was it meant to be five? Am I getting confused? Did Coventry come in separate to that? Uh, I think Coventry came in a year later, didn't they? So originally there was going to be four, and in the end there was only three, because if you remember, Northampton pulled out mm-hmm. sort of quite late on. And the other three were Hemel, who have basically been playing in Jews, training in Dewsbury. You had Gloucestershire and you had Oxford, and two of them teams are now gone. Mm-hmm. So you're left with one of them teams. Coventry came in, like, say, a bit later on. And you're like, well, hang on, we had this plan to expand a few years ago, and now it's like, well, what's happening now? And, and, and I've said it about Wales before, it's like we seem to have these ideas of expanding, but then, you know, I don't know how we decide which ones we run with and which ones we don't. I know people are saying, well, it's a lot different for, say, Toronto or New York or whatever, because there's obviously money men involved, and maybe that's the case. Hmm. You know, may, maybe, maybe that's the case. Uh, but, you know, like, hopefully the Bristol thing does does come out to be to work and then you're going to look at well they're going to have to restructure the league in some way you know maybe their inclusion will coincide with New York coming in to take it up to 16 teams and what a game that's going to be when New York play against York yeah that'd be a commentator's <laughs> nightmare <won't it? laughs> New York and York uh, I mean, again, you know, just sticking with that, that sort of almost development look, um, we've seen Toronto come out with a list of the first five players that are getting released. Well, Reese Jacks was the one I think you mentioned in our Love Rugby League team chat, didn't you, um, about being surprised that they 
sort of let him go. Yeah, I thought that they might Just have. It's a Canadian connection, isn't it, more so than anything else? But even so, they've explored it because he's, he's again of Canadian heritage rather than being a straightforward yeah, yeah. Canadian. So he counts on their overseas quota, right, which I think right. is the reason oh, why okay. they've ended up having to release him, especially when they're looking towards getting, you know, guys like Dave Taylor in and stuff yeah. like that. So he's taking a spot that maybe someone else could take and they're looking mm. at progressing it. I do think he's been a bit unlucky there, though. I mean, he's played 14 games, so that's probably what two thirds of the season, you know, from from looking at it. He's obviously got better as it's gone along. Other lads are maybe not as surprised about. Sean Pick was always a bit of a sidewinder, uh, in my opinion, because he was just coming back from a drugs ban at the time. Yeah. Uh, strangely enough, I remember he got he got suspended after the grand final that Lee won against Featherstone. Right. And he was playing for Featherstone on that night. So whereas Lee went upwards from that and Featherstone had a bit of a dodgy period afterwards, yeah. that, they all came via that. Uh, Steve Crossley's gone to uh, to Bradford, which is a real interesting signing for him. He just seems to keep bouncing. He's like a bouncing ball. He just goes from... But it's well, no, he's, the, he's not a bouncing ball. He's more like a boomerang, isn't he? he well, yeah, he's, yeah, he just keeps going back, yeah, doesn't he? Yeah, I, like think, I think it's his third spell, you know, so it's very rare you get yeah. players that have three different spells. I remember Timmy Street back in the day at Lee having three spells at Lee. Yeah, it'll be but, it will, it's going to be... It's going to be... The thing with Toronto thing, it's going to be more and more interesting this season because they're playing against much higher, you know, much better quality opposition. You know, they're not... You know, with all due respect to say Oxford and Hemel and teams like that, they were just rolling them over. Whereas in the Championship, every team will probably fancy their chances mm. against Toronto. Well, it's to be argued yeah. that even Siddle put up a better performance than some League yeah, One sides that, against them it. in the I cup. Bit, I think it's a bit different. Whereas they had, whereas they had quite a few walkovers in League One. I think in Championship, I think there's a lot, there's a lot less disparity between the top team and the bottom team in the Championship in comparison to League One, where. Mm. The Heartlands teams or the traditional Heartlands teams are much stronger than Oxford and Hemel and, and South Wales were. Interesting uh, as well that they announced that Sean Penkovic was retiring and since then he's gone and tweeted that he's got another year left in him yet. So that could be a, an interesting like, move for somebody, shouldn't yeah, it? Well, Penkovic's a good player, obviously. He's, yeah, very good. He's had his bands over his, over his career, which has been unfortunate, but he's been a good, a good championship player. But yeah, it, it, you know, really excited really to see what, what championship's going to be like with, with Toronto. Um, you know, and see where they get. You know, Featherstone now have obviously got you know a real, real halfback quality. They've got oh, they've got three they've got, really good halfbacks you know, there you now, know, aren't Richard they? Richard um, and Tim, uh, Tom Holmes. Um, you know, real good option. John Duffy's building a nice little team down there. Um, no, see, his brother's gone in as uh, assistant yeah, coach this time around. Right. It's going to be interesting, you know, to see. You know, you're looking at them three really: Leeds, Toronto, and, and Featherstone. And t- the- talking, well, yeah, I mean that that looks likely. We've not heard movements on London yet. I don't know whether any of you. Oh, well, obviously they've got obviously need a new coach, don't they? Yeah, yeah. So because because I would expect them to be there or thereabouts well, as well. To be honest, now with London because they have lost some key players. Don't forget, it's not just a case of they've lost Henderson, who was obviously building something there, but they have lost. Some some key players, you know, Bartow and uh, you know, and Akers we talked about, mm. um, Akers, whatever. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what they do because obviously whoever, I guess whoever they bring in as coach is then going to have to recruit to replace them and and see where they go. So it might be an interesting one with London. Maybe twenty eighteen might end up being a transition transition year for them. I still love the close season. Maybe. In- Maybe not in the fact that there's not a lot of rugby going on, but the race regarding the uh, NCL Grand Finals, which uh, if everything works and I can uh, tie the cans together, you'll be able to hear full commentary of tomorrow. Um, but it's really exciting. Even Lee East are getting back into pre-season training next week. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I mean a few teams are obviously getting worried, um, or a few sets of fans. You can see, on, you can gauge opinion on Twitter. I think quite nice, quite well. Like Witness and Salford fans are sort of panicking that they've not signed anyone. And, the know. thing is, though, I mean, a pre-season is twelve weeks long, isn't it? Yeah. So it, you can well, drag a player in at any pre- point well, in I that. I think that's the thing. I think people sort of think, well, pre-season starts start in November, and it's like we've not signed anyone. But it's like the other thing you've got to look at is some of these clubs who are perhaps less well off. If you sign him now, you've got to pay him for two months more than you would if you sign him in January. Uh, and also as well, and I've, I've had experience of this, when uh, a certain player that shall remain nameless, when I was doing filming down at Lee, we had to film right around him for almost an entire pre-season because he was in, he was doing all the training with everything, but if they announced it before a certain date, they would have to pay his previous club a transfer fee. Oh, right, okay. uh, so there's, there's all these kind of uh, murky waters as well that yeah. I'm Sure. You know, and, that, and I think that's the harsh reality. I think sometimes if 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 clubs know that you know if clubs know that 
they can afford to wait till January then do it because you know they don't want to pay a November and December salary. The other thing is about flights and you know if you're signing players from Australia, flights obviously more expensive in the lead up to Christmas mm -hmm. than they are after Christmas. You know little things like that that maybe fans don't think about that. You know, actually paying an extra five hundred quid or an extra thousand pound on on flights, you know, visas and stuff like that aren't cheap. Um, I think fans don't necessarily appreciate that in some of the clubs that are working on tighter budgets. Um, you know, those things can make a difference. Um, speaking of clubs on tight budgets, uh, the way we should mention the Wakefield Stadium saga, which has taken yet another twist this week with the uh, council. You know what? I think they made a they made a gross error of judgment, Wakefield. And I'm going to say with regards to releasing a picture every time you release a picture of a stadium it never happens like that does it it's never straightforward I mean it's, I mean, it's difficult <sighs> not to be cynical with the stadium situation um, you know because we've heard it so many times before but it just feels like you know Wakefield it felt like they were under a little bit of pressure you know were they getting threatened with the Super League future and then all of a sudden everything's hunky dory for five minutes the Super League future's seemingly secure and then this comes out after mm. and it's like mm. but I think bottom line is the RFL haven't got the they haven't got the guts really to throw anyone out, so I don't think it's going. I don't think it matters either way. I think I think if Wakefield was still playing in, at Bellevue in five years, as long as they're doing all right on the pitch, they'd still be in Super League anyway. It was interesting reading the council statement because it was almost uh, as if uh, a management different management company was going to be set up to run the stadium, which is similar to what has happened at Lee, for example, yeah, Salford's and Salford's the same, yeah, where, yeah. Uh, you know, they all pool resources, don't they, and, and yeah, ultimately... Yeah, it's a funny one, because the council was sort of accusing Wakefield of basically wanting to play there for free, hmm. um, but then still earn from, you know, the secondary revenue. Um, Obviously, we've not heard the Wakefield response of that yeah, yet, other well, than it's Wakefield in the hand of the legal they, people. They, yeah, Wakefield issued a statement, didn't they? And I think Michael Carter tweeted saying that he would never expect to play there rent free, but there's obviously a little bit more to it than that. Um, They've reached a, an impasse in negotiations, it would yeah, sound, doesn't it? For know, now? How long has this been going on for now? Uh, <sighs> Years. You know, so we'll in, fact, in fact, to be honest, when Wakefield got promoted into Super League, theirs was the entire reason that everybody else found it more difficult to get promoted in because of the they brought in sort of certain regulations didn't they for yeah, a spell like, around that time wasn't it it was like 97 98 mm. didn't they put a fund up for everyone to improve the stadiums and that's because that's how I witness improved their ground at mm. that time um, I'm sure there was a fund someone might know um, I can't remember what it's called but there was a, there was like a a fund to improve facilities and there was also a paper that was brought out yeah, around about 95 no, yeah, wasn't it framing the future yeah that, that's it yeah and obviously you know you know, ever since then, Wakefield have been banging on about a new ground, and obviously it's not happened. They built that nice block of flats for the sponsors. Yeah, yeah I don't, you know, I mean, they put a they put a they put a, a roof on top of the uh, the terracing. Yeah, true. Yeah. They did that bit down the side, so they have done a bit of work. But it's, you know, we're not we're not talking yeah, we're Featherstone not, standards, well, are we? I mean, we're not you, talking you, Batley. If you compare where Featherstone, second mention of a Batley notice. Batley, yeah, where if you compare where Featherstone have got to with their ground, mm. you know, and don't get Featherstone. We should shout out all the volunteers that help out with Featherstone. Oh, magnificent! They basically built a new stand with volunteers, you know, fans, and it's just like, you know, I think there's they think there's too many excuses now um, from certain people and certain clubs and. I do find it unfortunate, but I can never understand because I mean, are, are both Castleford and Wakefield serviced by the same council? Yeah, because it's Wakefield. I think it's Wakefield Metropolitan. So, so that covers includes Featherstone as well. So and I think that's part of the issue is that why haven't they knocked all uh, both heads together of Cass and, and Wakefield? Same built same one community stadium with fifteen thousand capacity, similar to a Lee or a Witness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that'd solve everything, well, wouldn't I, it? I think that's the problem, isn't it? Because it's like, you're not, you're not asking a council for one piece of land and one piece of funding. You're asking them for two pieces of land and two pieces of funding. We uh, always said, though, two, two heads are better than one, aren't they? Yeah, so, well, yeah, so... I don't know, it just seems like it's, it's going to be never-ending, I think, with the Casford and Wakefield situation. And like, until it gets to a point where the RFL basically starts saying, right, well... You either sort it or you're out, but the problem is, is I don't see that happening. You know, don't forget when we had licensing, the RFL basically did that. Remember, there was the list of five clubs mm. that they were unhappy with, which was St. Helens, Salford, Crusaders, Casford, and Wakefield. That was the only real time that we've 
we've had we've almost seen that threat of their future. Obviously, Salford and Saint Helens both got themselves sorted. Well, Casford and Wakefield are still exactly where they were when that happened. They're still languishing, aren't they? You know, we don't yeah. know. I mean, have, has there been any more pictures of anybody from Castleford with a spade in the no, hand? I'm not sure, but I mean, what's happened there? No, and as much as as much as we talk about, you know, it shouldn't be about stadiums. It should be about what's on the pitch. But then everyone's at, you know everyone's banging on about commercial and all that sort of stuff. If Super League wants to elevate itself, it's got to try and improve the standards so in a way you can understand you know conglomerates coming in from new york and people setting up clubs in toronto because that's yeah, that's that's, that's tapping, nice, tapping into a new market they're playing, they're playing nice into nicer stadium, stadiums but, you know, but can you imagine a can you imagine a big yeah it's like can you imagine a big a massive multinational sponsor coming in and, and going down to cast we don't with all due respect going down to castle stand ground and being like oh where do we put our boards up here or whatever mm. or, you know, can you imagine them taking guests? Because that's what sponsorship's all about. Mm. They want to wine and dine, you know, their big customers. And it's like, you know, they can either go to, you know, even some of the more modest grounds in, in the Premiership Rugby Union, like Gloucester. Brilliant ground, you know, really nice, really professional. Um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a new ground, but, you know, you just go there and it's got that aura about it. Whereas you go to some of these older grounds and you're just like, well, how's that going to, you know, how's that selling the game? So again, they're kind of missing the point, are they, of growing it? Yeah, I think so. So, but you know, it it must be difficult for them because it's like, well, what do you do? You know, what can you do? Um, so, it'd be interesting to see what happens with that um, over the close season, and obviously, hopefully, we'll find out sooner rather than later what then what on earth's going on beyond next season because we still don't know. We still don't know. You're, you're still asking the questions, asking and you're not questions getting any answers. No me, yeah, so. Okay, okay. Well, I've been trying to sort of find out from I. I might just make it up. I might, maybe I should just start a rumor and see whether they go with it. Well, that's how some tabloids have uh, done yeah, the news yeah. for years, isn't yeah, it? Maybe that's what we need to do. So, if anyone's got any suggestions about how they think the league should be structured after next year, then let me know, and we'll. We'll discuss the best one and then we'll uh, we'll pitch our ideas. Blog about Maybe it. Maybe that's what they should do. They could they could put it out to the fans, couldn't they? And then we could all work on a. They could shortlist the best ten and have us all present at Super League meeting and then vote on it there. Oh, interesting, could interesting. Do that, yeah, yeah. But I think you're much worse than Nigel Woods being doing. Yeah, but have you seen his his pay rise? He's just don't suggest that he's been doing much better. Well, yeah. Um, Michael's chipped up saying he's. he's He's saying that Hull FC did nothing, they just sat back and Hull Council built theirs, which is fine if that's, that's what happens, that's what happens. Um, I mean, some other clubs basically have had to push it a lot further, haven't they? I'm I thinking mean, even... Everyone's, everyone's, in a different, everyone's in a different boat. Mm. You know, everyone's council's a lot more cooperative than others. You know, Warrington's, for instance, are very cooperative because, you know, the club's pivotal to the town. But I would imagine that in, in, in other, you know, in, in maybe in Leeds is a bad example, but in, say, Bradford, it might be harder because of... The Bradford's history, or because of the football. Um, yeah, there we go. Martin's popped up about when Super League was formed in night. This is the framing for future thing. It was supposed to be split between purchasing players and developing stadiums um, in ground improvement, and that he's bang on. Whereas a lot of that money just got frittered away. Well, it got given to the players, didn't it? Yeah. There was a lot of that, there was a lot of bang average players in the mid nineties. That as much as as much as the players complain that they should be paid more, all of the money that comes into rugby league goes to players. Hmm. They need to find a way of siphoning and, more and off that, for the and grassroots that, and, that and for the, development and for all these things. Remember. I was having a conversation with someone last week, I can't remember what it was, who it was with. But ultimately, Sky put one and a half million into each club, whatever. That all goes on players. Simple as. Where, and, and if you think over, t- over 20 years, Wakefield would have had £30 million, maybe not that much, 20, 25, 30 million pounds, mm-hmm. just from TV money. You know, over the past twenty years, and and where's all that gone? It's just gone on players. Mm. It's a bit sad, really, when you look uh, at it like that, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and it's like you know, instead of looking at doing stuff with your infrastructure, where maybe if you invest a bit of that money on, as Martin says, if you invest something on the ground or in other areas, longer term, you'll make more money from your other revenue streams to then pay pay for players. But I still think you put it into grassroots, grassroots sport and the, the very amateur it's, clubs it's that, that you go around. It's not that, though, Dave. It's, it, 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 you know, how you, what are fans doing to get it? What are clubs doing to get more fans in? What are clubs doing to get more sponsors in? If they've got a little bit more cash to spend on marketing or advertising or whatever, you know, that then helps bring in more fans, which then helps bring in more money. So, yeah, OK... They might have spent fifty grand at the offset, but within two years they've doubled that investment. Whereas with players, 
once a player's contract's done, it's you, done, you, isn't it? No, there's no investment in players. Okay, yeah, you could argue that if you pay more, you get better players and you do better, and that helps get more sponsors. Which you know, it, you know, in some ways, it's true. But um, but yeah, I just think you know that that's something that certainly needs to be looked at funding wise, where everything goes to the players. And you know, I'm not I'm not trying to I'm not trying to stop players from from getting paid and and getting what they deserve, but. I think some of these clubs have got to start looking at. There are other sports that don't get any money, central funding. They don't get any central funding. They don't get any TV money, and then they they've still got to pay their players. So where how do they find the money? And they have to work for it. You know, like take ice hockey for instance in this country. Ice hockey. I've just read a, an article before we came on air that crowds in ice hockey in this country have increased twenty nine percent this season. Okay. So but what the, are they doing? The big clubs are getting maybe six, five, six thousand. And they don't get a penny of central funding. So all of them clubs have got to raise their own place. Now, they've all got 20 players, maybe. You know, they've got Canadians, Americans, Europeans. And, like, they can't just sit, you know, they can't just sit there and expect this one and a half million to come in. They've got to actually go out, sell tickets, sell sponsorship, you know, find the money from somewhere. And they manage it. You know, I, you know, I do a bit of work with a club in Glasgow, and they're they turning over three or four million pounds a year. Mm. So what are they doing that's different and to some other rugby players? It's just what? For, for me, it's for them in comparison to rugby, is is they're they're a lot more not desperate because that's unfair, that's the wrong word. But they've actually got to fight for every penny that they get. They've got to earn every penny. And I'm not saying that rugby league hasn't earned it by getting the sky deal, but I think it makes teams complacent when they know oh, they've got like one and a half million coming mm. in. Okay. You know, instead of whereas for for these for these ISA clubs, for instance, to be able to them. For them to be able to pay players, they've got to get more fans in, or they've got to sell more shirts, or you know, or, or, you know, all bits like that. Like you know, this club sells two and a half thousand shirts a year, and it's like you know, to be able to do that, you've got to stock, you've got to market. Yeah, it. yeah. And what? How does that work with regards to development of homegrown players, for example? Because ultimately, you need your players, don't you, to to sort yeah, of come and, through. You know, and that's another thing with that. Obviously, ice hockey is not very prominent in this hmm. country, so obviously. What's ironic about that is the British players actually carry more weight because you need to have so many British players. So the British uh, players right, okay. get more money, really, because they're more in demand, the better British players. I was just having to think about this, you know, just as you were talking regarding that, because, again, it comes back to my great halfback things, that we, we have a real dearth of halfback quality in this country because we're always looking at Australians and we're always bringing overseas players in. Mm. Do you feel then, or uh, like I do, and I'll just put this forward as a suggestion, we should have maybe more um, development, specialist development of those type of positions to get more um, players through? Is that where we could invest some of our money? I, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I think, I think whatever happens and wherever you put your money, clubs are always going to want the best players, whether he's Australian or English. They're always going to want the best they're always going to want the best half back, whether he, you know, like I say, whether he comes from Australia, whether he comes from Timbuktu, and I don't think you're ever going to move away from that. I think what what you need is you need to improve. Even like you look at the championship, if you could improve the quality of the championship, so the halfbacks, the English halfbacks playing the championship can compete at a better level. Mm -hmm. I think that's a better way of doing it. Um, you know, and, and trying like like Luke Gale, you know, for instance, he's gone down and played National League Two, and then come back up. Um, you know that that's when Martin's making the point. Um, let kids in for free, and then he says about um, catchment areas where local super club gets first choice of a player from that area. You and know what? This is an issue because obviously, because we. I mean, it might not be. As, I mean, I'm my geography of Yorkshire. I'm mean, obviously know where everything is, but they're, they're quite up and down in Yorkshire, aren't they? In terms of the areas, the catchment areas like Leeds is there, and okay. Whereas over here, it's like Warwick and St Helens and Witness are so close together that, like, they're all fishing for the same players, basically. But it's like someone, I was chatting to someone the other week, and they were saying that Widnes, for example, used to have 14 amateur clubs. Yeah, yeah. And now it's got four. Well, the, the thing is now is that the, the Widnes themselves bring kids in from, like, under 12s, under 13s, don't they, on the development squads. Well, Widnes brought a lot of lads in from, I can I can name three or four from the Lee area that yeah, are on Widnes scholarships but, but, and, and that, stuff. And that's the thing, Widnes are having to, it's almost like a food chain, so like St. Helens, St. Helens, I reckon, have probably got dibs and Wigan to an extent. St. Helens and Wigan have got dib, dibs on the best kids in the North West, mm -hmm. wherever they play, whether they play in Warrington, whether they play in Widnes. And then I think Warrington are obviously gradually getting there, but Warrington aren't renowned for their academy set up. 
and then Widness have basically just got to feed off whatever else. So that might send Widness out to Lee. You know, like look at look at Matt Whitley who was at St. Helens and got cast off. Let me be let me be a bit cynical here then. Would this highlight why Witness was so interested in Cumbria a couple of years ago? Because that opened so. up another lot of development I, kids I, that they could I bring in, so. didn't it? And I think, I think that's the problem. I think, you know, the catcher area is an interesting thing. It's like, because there's, you know, Percival's from Witness. He's playing at St. Helens. And that's what's happened. Percival's come through playing rugby in Witness. And St. Helens have, have picked him off. Rick, Danny Richardson's from Witness. Mm -hmm. You know... And, and I think ultimately the better clubs are always going to cherry pick them best players. Whereas you look at Richardson, Richardson would probably be witness, well, would have been witnesses starting scrum half for years. Mm. Whereas at St. Helens, he's still not quite getting through. Um, you know, uh, but that, that's just the way it is. I, I mean, I don't know. But I think, I think we're in a far better place now. You know, certainly from 10 years ago, there's a lot more English players playing the game now. I, a lot more English talent, if you like. And we've talked about this about the England team. Ten years. Well, they can pick from picked, forty players now, can't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. Ten years ago, the England team would have picked itself. Whereas now, um, you know, you, you, you're a lot deeper. Um, but you know, it's like you know, Witness is quite a good example because at the moment, because last season Witness used set thirty-seven players, and a large proportion of that had all come through their academy. Um, and our Witness now looking at well, they can't compete with Salford and Lee for for money for play or, or Salford have already until recently. Um, paying for players, you know, like Hutchison, who, who Lee have signed, let's say in theory, Witness had gone for him, Lee would probably blow Witness out of the water for him, based on the last two years. Um, so I have Witness identified that actually for them, the best solution for them is to try and make their academy as good as possible and bring through players that they've developed, and then potentially even sell on for a fee. Because mm. don't forget that, and, you know, look at Castleford. Castleford have done that with a few players they've brought through and then sold for a fee, which but the clubs like Casper who haven't got maybe the big, the big, they can't attract the biggest sponsors. They can't do all the commercial and hospitality type stuff that a Wigan can do. Selling a player for a hundred grand here or there, actually, you know what they could do. And and so I think maybe that's where Witness have, you know, I know for a fact Witness have looked at that over the last mm. five to ten years that they wanted to get to a point where. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I can't remember whether they've got to a point where they wanted to get twenty. Of the thirty-man squad, all homegrown. Well, it's cheaper, isn't as it? Soon ultimately, as yeah. And, you know, but then at the same time, we talked about it before. Leeds Saints and Wigan have all won Super League on a regular basis with a core of players they've brought in, mm. and that's why Warren. That's why I firmly believe that's why Warren haven't won it because, because there's not been enough of them. That. Yeah, and they haven't done that, and they're still doing it now, Warrington, where they're signing players from other clubs. But you're looking at it, and I mean that's that's a ten year project, isn't it? Yeah, and, and, yeah, and that's what it is. And, that, and, and they're okay, probably about five years into it yeah, now at Warrington, aren't they? And you look at you look at Witness. Witness, the, the current owners of Witness have been there for ten years now, and they've run an academy since day one. So obviously they were in Championship for um, for the first six years, eight, nine, ten, eleven. No, first four years. That's wrong. So the first four years under the new ownership, they were in championship, but they ran academy, they ran the under 16s, they ran the development squad. They've obviously carried it on in Super League, and it's only now, you know, it's only from this season got through that people have sort of sat up and took notice, haven't they? Where the oh, said witness have got some good youngsters coming through, and that's actually going to make or break witness now. Mm. Next season, if if the, the only way the only way witness I think are going to progress now or stay in Super League is if these youngsters step up and turn up. You know, turning the performances and turning into quality players, and that—that's what's going to save clubs like Witness now. Okay, um, okay. Uh, again, we'd love all your comments. Uh, I do realise that we've been going for quite some time now. Yeah, well, everyone's fallen asleep, haven't they? So we'd better let them go. So what we'll do is we'll sign off for this, but we will be back discussing England's performances next week. Next week, brilliant. Thank you. <laughs>